Um, if you are, uh, if you have your Bible today, we're going to be in First Kings chapter 19 is where we're going to be uh, starting off today. We are uh, in the middle of a series called Running with Giants. And I know that uh, during this season of our life that really we need as much encouragement as possible because we're going through the stuff, you know. I mean, right now I'm in what you call rec sports purgatory. I do 6U flag football, which is awful. And I do 10U softball, girls softball, which is awful. I mean, it's just strikeout after walk, after walk, after walk, after walk, hit, walk, 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 walk. And then 6U football, you're just like, just run that way. I don't care what the play is, just run that way, you know. So I need some encouragement in my life, and I bet you do too. But uh, this series comes from the book of John Maxwell called Running with Giants. And essentially the, the premise of it is, is that Hebrews chapter 11, many of us that have been in church, we know that Hebrews 11 is the, the heroes of the faith, the hall of faith, the hall of fame, so to speak. And it goes all throughout all these different characters, including David and Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Rahab and Deborah and Samson and Gideon. I mean, it goes all through these characters all throughout the Bible. Sarah is another one. And then it gets to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Now, the first word of Hebrews 12, 1 is therefore. Anytime you see the word therefore, you have to think and ask yourself, what's that therefore? <laughs> yeah, that's a, a church joke. Okay, anytime you see that, you know that whatever was just said previously, come on, y'all, that's funny. Anytime that's said, you see what was said previously, and basically the next phrase is the culmination of everything that was just said. So what, how, if it's a two verses or one verse or a whole chapter or a whole half a book, if it says therefore, that's a culmination of what just came before that. And it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, I want to tell you one more time, that does not just mean Abraham, Moses, and Jacob, and Isaac, and all these people, these great men of faith are looking down on us. That means your loved ones. That means your mom, your dad, your grandparents, your brothers, your sisters, some of you, your children are in heaven right now cheering you on, saying, do it. You can do it. I'm, I'm here, and I did it because I ran my race, and they're encouraging you to run your race. So there's this whole stadium full of people looking down on, on your life and trying to help you, trying to encourage you on. It says, so since that's the case, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles. Now, I'm glad that the Bible understands that sin is not easy to say no to. It's a hard and difficult journey. But it says, and let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Keep going, keep going, keep going. I don't know if you've ever been on a field or on a track or a stadium where you were the focal point, the center of the attention, and whether that was because you had the ball or you were on the track meet and you were running with the baton or, or you were kicking or, or whatever it was, you could be baton twirling, uh, wh whatever it is, you're in the middle of this field and you're playing an instrument and, and, and all of a sudden everybody uproar just starts clapping and, and, and shouting and saying your name and saying, oh, you're doing so great. It's one of those humbling experiences. It's one of the best experiences of your life. And I know some of you have been, it's been a long time since high school, but maybe you can remember those high school days of playing sports. Or, or maybe you were a college athlete or even a professional athlete and you can just remember those days. It's a humbling experience, but essentially what I want to do is I want to take that experience of these cloud of witnesses that are in these grandstands of heaven and I want to call one of, one of them down to the field every single week and I want to ask them, what would you say to us if you, in knowing what your life was, knowing that you ran your race and all the things that were in your race, what would you say to us right now concerning your life? Last week we talked about Isaiah. We brought him out of the stands and we talked about his life and how encountering God makes the biggest difference. And that sermon is on our website, myjeffersonchurch.org, if you missed that. But this week I want to talk about a prophet from the Old Testament called Elisha. Elisha was uh, a very famous prophet, but not nearly as famous as his, um, as his previous prophet, which was Elijah. Elijah was the guy, not Elisha, Elijah was the guy. He was the prophet of the Old Testament. He was probably the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. He never tasted death, meaning he never died. The Lord took him up in a chariot of fire to heaven. He fought evil head to head. I mean, he slew 450 prophets of Baal with the sword. He was a go-getter. Um, he, he went after King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. I mean, if you name your daughter Jezebel, you got problems, right? But anyway, uh, he went after these people head on. He appeared on the Mount, uh, Mount Transfiguration in the New Testament where Jesus was in his glorified body and there were disciples that were present. And as they told the account and as they saw what unfolded, they said Jesus was there in his heavenly glorified body 
body. And all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah stood next to him. He was part of that. And Elijah will come back to this earth after Jesus has returned, more than likely because Revelation says there will be two witnesses that will be called forth and that they will come and testify to what God has done. And one of those witnesses will be Elijah. And as great of a man as Elijah is, that's not who we're talking about today. Today we're talking about Elisha, his understudy, his servant, the second in command, so to speak. We're talking, about, we're talking about the guy that was washing the hands of Elijah, not even involved in the miracles, not even setting up the conferences or setting up the church or anything like that. We're talking about the lowest of the low. I mean the guy that washes the toilets of the prophet. I mean the guy that cleans the bathroom. I mean like, like, like he's the, the janitor of the situation. He is in no high position, no high authority. He's just simply one of the followers of Elijah because he probably had many followers going after him. This is Elisha that we're talking about. But the reason I want to talk about Elisha is because Elisha didn't come from something great. Elisha didn't come from a life where he was groomed to be this prophet. He didn't come from the temple like Samuel did. He didn't come from the temple like Jeremiah did. He was, he was just a normal, average, everyday Joe. I mean, just the normalest guy you can possibly think of. And Elisha spent most of his life in complete obscurity. He spent most of his life doing absolutely nothing for God. He spent most of his life maybe being a good Jewish boy sitting in a church or coming to a service or going to First Wednesday or being a part of a connect group. He just went about and did the things he was supposed to do, but there was nothing special about him, so to speak. And we all go through those seasons of our life where we feel like there's nothing special and we ask this question. When our life is going to count, we wonder, God, when is my life going to make a difference? When am I going to do something for God? When, when is this season of my life going to be over? When am I going to step into the next destiny, the next portion, the next place of my life? When is that going to happen? And we're sitting here and we're just waiting for God to do something for us in our life. Elisha was the same way. Elisha lived in obscurity. Elisha lived a life behind the scenes that he was not groomed to be a prophet. He was not groomed to be a man of God. He was not groomed to do anything great for God. He was just a normal Joe Blow just like anybody else. But God used him. And God accounted for that. And see, we see that in the last part of 1 Kings and the first part of 2 Kings. That Elisha was like many of us. That he, he wanted some things. He had some dreams in his life, but he was kept waiting and just doing the mundane tasks of everyday life. You see, the book of, uh, of 1 Kings tells us in chapter 19 that Elisha was a farmer. But he wasn't just a farmer. He was a successful farmer. He was a guy that knew what he was doing. Because as, as he moved on, we find him that he is, he is actually plowing with two oxen, a team of oxen in front of him. But that was his everyday job. Don't let that be glorious or glorify it like you think you should. He was simply behind the, the, the rears of two oxen every single day of his life. Think about it. Monday through Friday, his job was to look at two behinds of oxen. That's what he was supposed to do. I mean, he walked down there and he got the residue thereof, if you know what I'm talking about. Like the byproduct. He got to see the by... I can't say the word on stage, but he, he saw the byproduct of two oxen coming out. He smelled... A he, it was awful, terrible, de de awful, de really, really bad work. And you can imagine, and I want to give you a picture of it. This is what his day looked like. Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, for years, all of his life, up until he met Elijah, it was like this. Some of y'all are like, that's what my Monday looks like right now. Like, I'm, I'm going to go to work tomorrow, and I'm a teacher, and my day looks just like that, you know. Bunch of oxen ends, that's what you want to say. But anyway, um, um, even though his life started that way, here's the promise. Even though his life started that way, he would eventually get to a place where he surpassed even the person he was understudying. He would get to a place where now the servant or now the, the pupil has become the master. Because Elijah did 14 recorded miracles in the Old Testament. But Elisha did 28. The most miracles of anybody except Jesus. The most recorded miracles of anybody. Elisha. And he didn't start off well. He wasn't groomed to be this man of God. This pro he, was just, he was just a regular everyday average Joe. But that's like us. Sometimes you feel like your viewpoint every single day is the rear end of two oxen. 
Hopefully you don't turn over and see the rear end of two oxen. But I'm just saying like, like you know, you, every single day you wake up and you're like, man, my life is just going. It's just mundane. And it, and it seems like this is the way it's going to be. And it's never going to change. God, when are you going to do something? God, when are you going to move? When is my life going to make sense? When is my life going to count? For when your life feels like it doesn't count, you have to give your best to whatever God puts you in. Right. You have to give your best to whatever God puts you in. That's the, that's the theme of the life of Elisha. That even when God puts you in the mundane task and the things that don't seem like they're so glorious and it's not in the spotlight, God is saying, I'm giving you an opportunity to show me what you can do because you need to give your best wherever God puts you. You have to understand that whenever you're doing the smelly, <laughs> the oxen's rear end, part of the deal. Whenever you're doing the mundane things, the boring things of your life, I need you to know this, and this is the story of Elisha's life. God is watching you. God's seeing what you're doing. God notices. He is taking notice of what's happening in your life, and, and you have to understand how God works because what God does is he watches you before greatness ever comes to you. That before bestowing greatness upon you and just like labeling you as the next best thing, instead of doing that, he watches your life before that event ever takes place. And he sees, how is he going to react? How, what lessons can he learn? How can he be a better leader? How can she be a better mother? How can they be better parents? How can they move forward? Because what God sees is potential in you, but he's not going to lay greatness on you before the potential can come. That that would be putting the cart in front of the horse, so to speak. That Elisha, just, just some... Three ideas from Elisha's life is that wherever you are, and it's something that can apply to us, wherever you are, you have to give your best in obscurity and God will reward it in public. Give your best. Can I get an amen of that right there, anybody? You have to give your best in the obscure moments, in the mundane, the dull, the boring things, the things that are not that much fun. You've got to give your best and do it to the glory of God and not the glory of men. That's what the New Testament says. Give your best in the obscure moments and God will reward it. He's faithful, everybody. That obscurity and, and what we think obscure, it's, it's when nobody notices what we're doing. And it's not like we're trying to go unnoticed. We're trying to get noticed, but nobody appreciates it, right? Like, like my wife, for instance, she, she'll make the comment sometimes. She said, well, I did the dishes today. And what she wants me to do is she wants me to say, Chanel, you did such a great job doing the dishes. Thank you so much. Well, I did a ton of laundry today. I can't believe we even have something to wear. All the laundry is in the washer right now. Thank you so much. for." It. She wants to be recognized, but so many times she does that without even being recognized, without even being noticed, because that's what obscurity is. It's when you're not being noticed, and sometimes we think even God is not noticing what we're doing. That we think the mundane, the boring, the everyday moments of our life, of the, life the time where you just come to church and you just hold open a door, or you help serve coffee, or you're an usher, just the everyday, regular, mundane things, the time where you just put the kids to bed and you pray over them. You're like, is this really going to make a difference in the span of history? Absolutely it will, but right now it doesn't seem that way because it's obscure. It's little, it's small, it's hidden. First Kings chapter 19 is where it starts. And it says, so Elijah, the big, bad, mama jama prophet, Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Saphat, plowing in a field. And there were 12 teams of oxen in the field. Now, let me just go ahead and tell you. Nobody had 12 teams of oxen back in those days. Elisha was rich. He was filthy, stinking rich. Uh, it's, it's, it's essentially you having a 24-car garage and you pulling out all 24 cars. That's what that looks like. He had so much. He was doing very well. His family was very wealthy. And Elisha was plowing with his 12th team, the Bible says. Then Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak on his shoulders, which basically means... Um, you're going to be my understudy. You're going to be my apprentice. I'm going to help you. I'm going to hire you. He put him across his shoulders. But then watch this. Elijah just walks away. Just walks away and leaves. And from that point for 10 years, all Elisha did was follow Elijah. He went from wealth to nothing. He went from being somebody in his own world and in his own right, 12 teams of oxen, to the servant of a prophet that didn't even have an, his own home that didn't have a reliable source of income. He went from wealthy to being poor. Even though Elisha knew he was called, and you know you're called. Listen to me. You know, a lot of us know what God has for us in our life. You know that you're called. And he had dreams too. And you have dreams too. But listen to me. Even before the dreams come, and before the things grow in your life, and before they come to fruition and become fruitful in your life, you've got to know God sees the small things. 
He sees the obscure moments. He sees the way that you're treating your spouse when nobody's looking. He sees the way that you're disciplining your kids before, no, before anybody even sees it. He sees the small, mundane things of your life. Can I tell you that you see me as a pastor of the Jefferson Church, and it's, a, I believe, the greatest church in Jackson County, and I love being the pastor. I love waking up. I love my job. I love my calling. I wake up every morning, and I, can't, I pinch myself. I can't believe it, but listen to me. You don't know who I was before this. I was not pastoral material. Let me just go ahead and tell you right now. I was not pastoral material. I was athletic material because my granddaddy was a pastor. My mom was a pastor. I had seen too many deacons meetings go wrong and church votes go wrong and all these things where my mom went home crying and my granddaddy went home downcast. And I was like, I don't want anything to do with that. So I'm going to go headlong, headfirst into every sport I can do. I cannot quote scripture. I cannot do a lot of things that so-called pastors could do or would be trained to do to do this, but I tell you, I could throw a football, I could throw a baseball, I could shoot a basketball. Matter of fact, we had our basketball connect group last Monday, and my team won, God's team won, everybody. That's what happened, okay? <laughs> and some of y'all that are coming this Monday, you need to know you need to be on my team, but I could shoot a basketball, I could dunk, I could, I could hit a baseball and throw. I mean, I could do all those things. I was not pastoral material. I wasn't a bad guy, but I wasn't pastoral material. But then all of a sudden, God began to call me. And he didn't call me to a stage immediately. Look at me. He did not call me to this place immediately. It took years of doing the obscure things that brought me to this moment. And I don't think God's done, but it took years of the obscure things that brought me to this moment. I, I didn't lead worship initially. I played in a band, and I was off like guitar to the point where my worship leader went to my amp and turned my amp all the way down and said, now play. <laughs> I wasn't good. I wasn't great at singing. I wasn't great at, at leading, at being a leader. I wasn't good at those things. It, it didn't come naturally to me, but it was in the obscure, the, the low, the, the small moments of my life that began to build. And as I began to play behind the scenes and then turn my amp up a little bit when he wasn't looking, when I began to get a little bit better and then I began to lead for our middle schoolers and I began to lead for our high schoolers and eventually in Athens, I led for the whole church on a couple Sundays and God continued to build and build and build when I started in the small things. I got to a place where I didn't want to be a pastor, but, man, I would volunteer all day long. And Chanel would know that. That would be our argument before we got married. She said, I'm supposed to marry a pastor. And I said, well, I'll volunteer all day long, but I am not going to be a pastor. I can tell you that right now. And look where I am, right? <laughs> it's like I'm not, I would volunteer all day long. I would volunteer with middle schoolers, you guys. And you know you got to be called if you volunteer with middle schoolers. I mean, you know, like, there's a calling on your life to do something great because that could be the closest thing to a near-death experience in your life is simply going to a middle school camp. But Matthew 6, verse 4 says like this, your father who sees what's done in secret, he'll reward you out in the public. Your father that sees what's done in secret, he'll reward you out, right? And that passage continues and it says, you know what, as a matter of fact, don't do anything for, for everybody else's recognition because when you do stuff for other people's reward, that's exactly what you'll get and you will miss out on God's reward for your life. He says that when you pray, don't, he says, don't do as the Pharisees do. They come out and they say, oh, Lord, Father, dear God, just bless us. I know I'm holier than everybody else. No, don't do that. Just have your own little prayer time and, and don't let anybody know you're doing it. When it says, it continues, it says, when you fast, don't suck your cheeks in and, and, and put your rib cage in and say, oh, I'm so holy because I'm about to die. Like, don't, don't do that, right? Just, just fast. Don't, you know, put your makeup on. Come on now, guys, get, take a shower. Don't, don't, don't look so solemn when you fast. It says when you give, don't go, oh, man, here come that bucket. Y'all see my wallet? It's coming out. pa -ching! There you go. Don't do that. Look at how many zeros I got on this check. Don't do that because you're missing out on the reward God wants you to have. You're missing out on what God wants to give you. That what he sees done in secret, he'll reward you. The second thing we see from Elijah's life is that if you give your best in the small things, God will give you bigger things to do. If you give your best in this, now listen, this is not easy preaching. Because a lot of us are in the small things time of our life. Some of us, we're seeing the fruits and we're seeing the labor and some of us, it's kind of getting there. But a lot of us in this room, you just started that job. You just came out of college. You just had a family. And the small things are what's the mundane, boring, I cannot believe I have to do this every day kind of mentality. But the small things, if you do your best in those things, God will give you larger stuff. If you take care of the things you've got now, I promise you God will give you more. 
If you take care of, of your body right now, God's going to improve your health. I promise you. If you take care of the car you got now, God's going to help you down the road. I promise you. God is going to make blessings come upon you in, in your life, but you've got to do your best with the small things, and it comes from Elisha's life. That 1 Kings 19, verse 21, so Elisha returned to his oxen, and he slaughtered them. He, he killed the family inheritance. He killed everything that he had. He said, I don't want anymore. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. And then he went with Elijah as his assistant. He went from being somebody to being a nobody. He went from being top shelf, he could go to Fogo de Chao anytime he wanted to in Buckhead and pay the full price and tip them well. He could do anything because he probably, you know, uh, produced the beef that they're eating right there. But anyway, he was there in the moment. He was, he was the guy and took it all away and said, no, God, you've got something bigger for me, but I've got to start in the small areas of his life. He went from owning lots of money and being successful to being a servant. In 2 Kings chapter 3, it, it makes a reference to that Elisha was the man who poured water on the hands of Elijah, meaning that Elijah was this great prophet. All Elisha did was just help him get ready for his meals. Because in those days, the prophet didn't even wash his own hands to, to, to prepare to eat his meal. Somebody else did it for him. That's how lowly of a job he had. In the small, the mundane, the, the terrible moments, that's when God wants to see what you're going to do with the small things. Because he'll give you bigger things in the end. Many of you know that I'm a part of FCA, which is Fellowship of Christian Athletes. I believe in FCA. I think FCA is the greatest tool we have to get into our high schools and middle schools with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a conduit. It is literally a conduit that is open right now, and we're thankful that it is because it's an official club in your school. And if your kids are not involved in FCA, get them to FCA. It's a Bible study every single week of local pastors coming around and speaking to them. If you're not supporting FCA, you need to support FCA because God is doing great things in our schools, but I'm so proud to be a part of that. I was a part of it when I was in high school. I was a part of it when I was in college. And then when I got to Gainesville, Georgia to be uh, a youth pastor there, just to get plugged into the, to the pipeline of the social pipeline, just to get plugged into getting to do anything, just to serve anything, I got plugged back into FCA. But you know what I started doing? I started just showing up to meetings even when I wasn't invited. <laughs> I just showed up, stood in the back of the room, didn't try to have relationships with anybody. Didn't try to like get, get involved. Just, just stood there. Man, if they needed orange juice, hey, you know what I did? I, I split out to the store and I got them orange juice and I brought them back because they had breakfast. If they need a battery for a microphone, I ran to my car. I had a pack of batteries in my car for just such an occasion, and I would run to my car and bring it to them. Hey, if, 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 if something happened and a kid wasn't there and they need to look, I went and looked for a kid. Like I did so much of the small things, and then one day I was at East Hall High School. And the speaker didn't show up. And they said, hey, can, any, can anybody, anybody have a devotion? Anybody? I was like, I got one. I just preached last night at youth group. Let me come up there and do that bad boy. And I walked up there and I spoke. And from then on, y'all, I became the chaplain of the East Hall football team. I was, in, I was at the FCA every single uh, month, every single week. I was there. I was a part of it. That There were very few kids, high schoolers or middle schoolers in the East Hall community that did not know who I was. I get to Jefferson. I get to Jackson County. And because I was faithful in the small things in Hall County, FCA allowed me to be the missionary of all of Jackson County. So I was in Commerce High and Middle. I was in West Jackson and Jackson uh, High School. I was in East and East Jackson Middle. I was in Jefferson High and Jefferson Middle. And I would walk in there and I would preach the gospel and they would give me the opportunity sometimes once or twice a month and I'm preaching and I can't tell you how many salvations have come from those instances but I'll tell you about one time that one time when I paid my dues so to speak and I did the small things the FCA head of the area came to me he said we got a football camp coming up there's six high school football teams getting ready to come Buford was one of them Jefferson was one of them and they started naming all these teams that were coming there and I thought oh man how many kids they said 400 kids are going to be there this week I was like oh man this is great this is awesome I stood on that stage and in one night 45 football players gave their life to Jesus listen to me listen to me that's not a pat on the back that's because I was faithful with the small things and God gave me bigger things I was faithful with the small moments the obscure moments the moments that nobody else saw and now God's giving me bigger things to the point where I can walk into any high school any FCA right now and they know exactly who I am the administrators know, know who I am the principals know who I am the athletic directors know who I am all because I was faithful with small things now God's giving me influence over many things it's all because I did small stuff 
Luke 16 says it like this. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. The third thing we see from Elisha's life is that when you give your best in the natural, God will do the supernatural. Now, some of y'all right now, you're like, man, I don't know about all this supernatural stuff like that. Like, I don't know if I can handle that kind of mess. Like, what are you talking about supernatural? I'm talking about things that are above your ability to accomplish and to do. I'm talking about things that you don't have a prayer of getting in the rooms that you should be in rooms with. You, you should not have meetings with the people you're having meetings with, but somehow it happens and somehow it works. That's what I'm talking about. That's a version of the supernatural. But all you have to do is the natural. And when you give your best and do your best in the natural, God will do do what he does in the supernatural. And Elisha would say, I had no idea that even when I asked God for amazing things, you know, you, you, you just ask for off the wall things, just things that are completely outside of what you thought. You're like, man, wouldn't that be a cool idea? Guess what? God did it. God did the things that he asked for. God did the things that he sought for and dreamed of. In 2 Kings chapter 2, as we swap uh, books, it says 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. This is the chariots of fire story where Elijah was taken up into heaven and he never died. And so you can read the rest of that. But in verses 9 and 10, it says, When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken from you. Can I tell you something? Every single morning you wake up, God's asking you the same thing. Tell me what I can do for you. What, what do you want to ask me? What's something that, that you haven't, what's something you haven't brought to me yet? What's something that I can do, not to make your life better, what's something I can do so that I can be made great in your life? What's something that, that you need? And I believe with all my heart, when you lay your head down on your pillow at night and you look up at a dark ceiling, those are the real prayers and those are the things that you bring to God. And that's the time you think about stuff like, God, we just need more money. We just need more income. God, we just need a bigger house, and I don't see how it's going to happen. Look, God, we need to be debt-free, and I have no idea how this is going to work out. Would you just, I'm telling you, when you simply ask, you are doing all you can do in the natural, and God is going to take the supernatural over. God's going to produce the supernatural for you in your life. So Elijah asked Elisha, what do you want me to, what, what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? And that's exactly what God is asking us. It's the exact same question. What can I do for you today? And Elisha, I like Elisha. Elisha swung for the fences. I mean, Elisha didn't, he didn't back down from that. He was like, oh, you know, just a little bit. And sometimes our prayers, that's how it sounds like, oh, God, would you just bless me? Amen. Well, what does that mean? Bless this food to the strength and nourishment of our body, and our body to the end of this service. Amen. Like, what does that even mean? You just spoke in tongues. You don't even know. Like, I mean, you're there, right? It's, it's this crazy idea that, that we just say these prayers and somehow they mean something. But no, God says, I want you to ask me for the big things. I want you to ask me for the supernatural things, but asking is all you have to do. Because Elisha swung for the fences. I like Elisha. Elisha's my kind of guy. He was a normal guy, and then God made him something. But when he got the opportunity, man, he took his opportunity. Because he actually insulted Elijah. He said, hey, Elijah, I know you're the greatest prophet in probably the whole like, world right now. And everybody's going to talk about you, and they're going to write about you in Hebrews chapter 11. And they're going to sell these great things. And as great as you were, you know what I want? I want double what you got. Twice. As good as you were, I want to be even better. As great as your name's going to be, I want my name to be even greater for the glory of God. He says, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah says, you've asked a difficult thing. See, that's where the supernatural comes in. It's a difficult thing. Yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours. Listen, all Elisha had to do, this is what I'm trying to tell you. All Elisha had to do was the natural, and all he had to do was ask. That was the natural moment of his life. All he had to do was, was lay down. All he had to do was get along with God. All he had to do was simply ask, God, I don't have the ability at all, but Lord, I'm asking you, will you help me? Can I ask you something today? Have you stopped asking God for big things in your life? Have you stopped asking God to really do something miraculous in your life simply because it hasn't happened yet or because you don't believe it can happen. Can I encourage you to dream again? 
Can I encourage you to look to a God that can do the impossible in your life? I'm preaching 66.7% better than you acting this morning. I really am. Like, I, I feel it on the inside of me right now. Like, God is calling us to dream again. And that dream that was dead, God can revive it because that's what he does. That dream that was gone, that was outcast, that, that, that is no longer inside your mind, all of a sudden God says, ask me again and see what happens. Ask me again. Do the natural. Do what I, what I know you can do, and I'll do what I can do. Stop insulting God with your low-brow, low-expectation prayers. Ask God for big things. Lord, I know my son is a messed up kid, but God, would you touch him? That's a big thing. I know my kid is failing every class, but would you help him to get in line and get there? I know that's a big thing. God, I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. Would you help me get out of this thing so I can be a blessing to other people? That's a big prayer and that's a big deal. John 14 says it like this. Whoever believes in me will do works that I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these. That's Jesus talking because I'm going to the Father. All you have to do is ask me. I need you to look at yourself right now in your life, not like look at yourself. I need you to look at me, but look at yourself. In turn. I need you to ask yourself, when was the last time you asked God for something greater than you could do? When was the last time you asked God for a dream that was bigger than you? He says, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Musicians, you can come. Pastor Cohen, you can come. Because my question to you is, why not? Like, what do you have to lose if you... Don't ask God. If you do ask God and he says no, then you're in the same boat and you're still in the graces of God. But Elisha would say, I had no idea that I would see what I got to see. I had no idea that in the humble beginnings, the mundane, the everyday, average, ordinary tasks that I was doing, I had no idea that God would pick me. Because I saw three things. I saw that God was watching me in the small moments, in the obscure moments. I saw that he was watching me do the small things. And you know what I did? When it came my opportunity and when it came my time, I just asked. And he followed through with it. He gave me everything that I could ask for and more. So Elisha's been walking around the track with us for a while. He's come out of the grandstands and he's walking on the field with us for a while. And he's just sharing this part of his life, this information. But what are some actual words he'd say to us? Like if Elisha was standing in front of you right now, what's something he would actually say to you in this moment? I feel like this is what Elisha would leave you with. These are just some words of encouragement, just two things. The first thing he would say, you've got to learn to cultivate the presence of God in your life. Pastor Nick, what does that even mean? That means find you a place where you can get alone with the God of the universe and the God who loves you every single day. For me, a lot of times that was just my car. I still have a little Ford 2010 black Ford Fusion that the speakers were phenomenal in that thing. And I would play my little worship playlist and I would turn it up so loud that sometimes I'm wondering, am I about to go deaf? But man, I'm driving down the road and there's people looking at me and man, there's times in that car when I get alone with God, my eyes are wide open, my eyes aren't shut, but I'm going, oh God, I'm listening. You know, like you're crying, that ugly cry that nobody else needs to see you cry. And people are looking at you like, what is wrong with him? And I'm like lifting my hands, I'm clapping. Why? Because I'm learning moments where I can get in God's presence. And when I get in God's presence, listen to me, he speaks to me. He tells you dreams. He tells you, he gives you direction. He gives you guidance. When you get in his presence, and Elisha would say, learn how to get in those moments. Find those places where the presence of God can be a part of your life. So the story that I want to pull this from is my, one of my favorite stories of the Bible. I have preached a sermon on this. I love this sermon to death. It's called Digging Ditches. But in 2 Kings chapter 3, there's a dilemma that comes on. The kingdom of Judah, the kingdom of Israel, and the kingdom of Edom, these three kingdoms, are going to war against a kingdom of Moab all over some sheep, some just some ridiculous sheep. That's what they're going to war over. And they head out to fight the king of Moab, but they don't do a lot of planning. And they get out in the desert, and it takes them a little longer than they thought, and they're stranded in the middle of the desert with no water. You cannot live more than 72 hours without water in your body. Everything's dying. Cows are dying. Armies are dying. Generals are dying. Everything that comes along with them, this caravan of hundreds of thousands of people, they're dying. And they're in a spot. So what do they do? 
they used that, that forever. They said, is anybody, is anybody talk to God? Does anybody have a presence or an audience with God that we know? Anybody. And they said, well, Elijah's dead, but there's this guy named Elisha, just this obscure, know-nothing prophet, poured the hands on the water of Elijah. I mean, that's all he did. He was just basically his handmaid, his servant. That's all he was. I said, well, he's the only one. Come on and bring him. So he comes to this moment, and he stands in front of kings. He gets there, and they say, we need water. You need to help us. The first thing he says, bring me a harpist. I said water, not harpist. I, we need water. Ah, agua. We, 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 need, we need you to help us with our thirst problem. And, and Elisha is essentially saying, look, I can't help you with your problem until I get in God's presence. If you want me to help you with what you need, I need help from the person who can help you. But I got to get to know him. I got to get in his presence. So he brings the harpist. He brings the pastor Cohen of the day. And he plops him down on stage in front of all these kings, in front of all these people. And he says, bring me a harpist. And it says, while the harpist was playing, just like this, while the harpist was playing, the hand of God came upon him. And that's when help came. You want to know why? It's because when you get in God's presence, he speaks to you. He speaks to you. I've never heard God talk a day in my life. Has God ever given you a dream? You ever had a dream? in your mind of something better, something greater that you could never accomplish by yourself? Ever had that happen to you in your life? Do you know what that is? God talking to you. It's God saying, I've got something better. I've got a better plan for you. I've got a better purpose. When you get close to God, He will speak because your dreams are always birthed in God's presence. They're always birthed in God's presence. Acts chapter 4 says, When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Can I tell you what sets you apart from everybody else? Spending time with God. There's no substitute for it. It sets you apart from everything and everybody else. Because when you get alone with God, He speaks to you and you act different and you see different and you do things differently. People say, how are you living the life you're living? Because I get to talk to God every day and He tells me where I need to go. It's not man's wisdom, it's God's wisdom. And that's what you need in your life. And that's what Elisha would say. Is you've got to have the presence of God in your life so He can speak to you and speak to those dead dreams in your life. I'm telling you, just because you're divorced doesn't mean you have to be unhappy the rest of your life. Just because somebody left you, it doesn't mean marriage can't come or happiness can't come. Just because you had deaths in your family, just because you had jobs fail you, it does not mean God is done with your life. That's just a mundane moment that God's getting ready to resurrect in your life. That's what it is. That every time God's ever spoken to me, it's always been through a, a, a season of prayer or a season of fasting. Every time. God showed me the vision of this church, and I've told you that story. Guess when that was? Chanel and I were praying and fasting. God, God showed me uh, the, the fact that we need to hire Pastor Cohen. He showed me Pastor Cohen during a moment of prayer and fasting. God has given me so many. I, he's given me a vision right now that I've only told maybe three or four people in, this, in, in my life. And if I were to tell you, it would scare your socks off. But I'm telling you, it's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. I know that was real obscure and mean for me to just dangle a care in front of me like that. But I'm telling you, God is speaking to me. Do you know when it came? It came during a season of fasting and praying. So he brings the music out. And Elisha would say this, the second thing, final thing, he would say, your dreams are fine. Dreaming is okay. And God wants you to dream. But at some point, you've got to wake up and do something. At some point, You've got to make the move. And a lot of people are just sitting here. You are sitting in this room like I've done in my life, like I may be doing in my life right now. And you're sitting there like, well, do you have a dream? Oh, yeah, i got a dream. Well, what is it? Well, I'm just waiting on God to move. Can I tell you something? Let me, let me just wake your mind up this morning. God's waiting on you to move. God's already spoken to you. God's already laid it out. The Bible says before the foundations of the world, He already knows what's going on. It's already the path in front of you. It's prepared. It's laid. It's there. He's your shepherd. He's going to guide you. But you've got to get up and do it. You've got to get up and do something. In 2 Kings chapter 3, after the harpist and after the hand of the Lord was upon him, he said, you've got to make this valley full of ditches. Holes? Are you kidding me? 
What, what are ditches going to do? We're digging further and deeper into the problem that we have. How is that going to fix what we got? You see, the supernatural is going to come involved, and God's going to take over, and God's going to do something that's going to blow your socks off. That's essentially what Elisha's saying. Dig this valley full of ditches. You've got to take action on your dream. Listen to me, businessmen, businesswomen. You've got to take action on that dream. The, the time to sit back is done. It's over. You've got to do what you got to do. Some of y'all may need to quit a job. Now, I'm not telling you to quit a job, but you need to pray to God and get this thing right. Some of y'all need to quit what you're doing and move forward and do what God's told you to do in your life. Come on, some of you, you're, you're moms and dads, and, and you're just saying, well, when they get older, they'll be easier to handle. No, they will not. Get on it right now. Step up and do something right now. If you want that dream family, it doesn't come from just dreaming about it. It comes from doing something about it. Because this is what happens. Dreaming has to go from inspiration to participation. Boy, that's good. Golly. It has to go from thinking about it, wondering about it, dreaming about it, and God's going to say, I need you to do something to participation in your life. Because James 2 says it like this. Faith by itself if it's not accompanied by action, it's dead. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help anybody. So can I tell you to do something today? Go dream. I want you to leave this building today. And I want you to get along with God. And I want you to ask him, God, what do you want me to do? I'm in this mundane, small thing moments and I'm okay. Or maybe you're in the small things moments and you just need to be faithful in those moments. But you need to ask God, God, what's the dream? What's the purpose? What's the plan for my life? You need to get along with God and get that. But when you get that dream, get up and go start doing something. But holding the door is not my dream. Holding kids and J-Kids, that's not my dream. Helping out in J-Kids, helping out in J-Youth, being on stage and being a background singer, that's not my dream. Guess what? God's watching the small things. God's watching the obscure moments of your life. God's watching you when nobody else is. And God is taking note of what he can trust you with because he said... If I can trust you with little, then I can give you much more. So maybe the reason, ooh, listen to this. Maybe the reason you're living in lack is because you're not faithful what God's given you right now. That goes for money. That goes for children. That goes for happiness. That goes for your job. Maybe the reason you don't get the promotion is because you scorn and hate the job you're going to right now. Well, what would happen if you did it with all your might and did it to the glory of God and not to man? Elisha's speaking to us. And before he comes out from the, before he leaves the field and goes back in the stands, I think he just wants to tell us, look, the small things matter to God. If you want big things to come in your life, and we all do, and God does, God wants dreams to come to fruition in your life so he can get the glory. But if you want that to happen, you've got to step out. You've got to do something. You've got to dream. Can I tell you something that God told me at the beginning of this year? It's written on my board in my office. You cannot grow until you can control what you have. You can't grow until you control what you have. We grew by crazy percentages. I mean, pastors call me, what are you doing? What's happening? I'm like, it's just God. I don't know what's going on. But we got to a place where we were so understaffed and so many people and so much stuff going on. And we were drowning. We were trying to just swim, get all this stuff done. And all of a sudden, God spoke to me and he said, before you'll grow anymore, you got to control what you have. Can I tell you, that's the same concept of you've got to be faithful in the small thing. And God will give you big things. So what's the dream? What's the purpose? What's the plan God has? Some of you know it. Some of you need to pray for it. But once you do, get up and start doing something. Even if it doesn't directly go towards that vision or dream for your life, I promise you, get up and start doing something your whole life will change.